Good afternoon and welcome back to Earth Talks. First announcement, and I tried to think of a cool April Fool something or other. I could tell you now, but I'm not that creative. <laughs> we won't be having a meeting next Monday. Please celebrate the eclipse, which will be happening, ending halfway through the talk, um, which we won't be having. <laughs> but we will be back on schedule in two weeks. And we'll be hearing from Michael Waring from Drexel University, which will be a nice follow-on to Kirsten's presentation because he does indoor air quality. Mm -hmm. Today, I am pleased to introduce for her first visit to Happy Valley, Dr. Kirsten Kohler, who is a professor now, right? Yeah, it's a Thursday. <laughs> As of Thursday, a professor in the <laughs> Environmental Health and Engineering Department. So we've been studying degrees and programs and things as the different folks we have come through. Interesting department, Environmental Health and Engineering at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Uh, Dr. Kohler earned a bachelor's degree from UCLA. Can I ask you? Atmospheric science. Atmospheric science. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then a master's and PhD degree in atmospheric science from Colorado State University. Sounds pretty traditional. Until then, she did a postdoc in public health to uh, expand her expertise in that area. She's the lead investigator on, among other things, an innovative and large and interesting network of low-cost air quality and greenhouse gas sensors spread all across Baltimore, which you can imagine is a pretty hot quantity right now, given events. And it's a very interesting initiative in general, because if you've ever tried to talk with folks in the community about how can I monitor air quality, this is quite challenging. So these are cool measurements, and she will speak with us today about this topic. So let's welcome... Kirsten to Penn State. I'm going to deviate slightly and kind of talk a little bit about how low cost sensors can be used in environmental health applications and kind of give you an overview of how I think about the ways that we can use them to our benefit in the field. Um, first, a little motivation. Why do we want to do this? Well, if we look at the top risk factors in the U.S. for morbidity and mortality, so being sick and or dying, and we um, rank these um, according to the daily adjusted life years or DALIs, then we can see that if we eat right, we exercise regularly, watch your weight, drink in moderation, don't smoke or use drugs, then what we're left with is that ambient particulate matter air pollution is the 10th leading cause of morbidity in the United States and the number one risk factor for those who choose a healthy lifestyle. None of us have choice but to breathe wherever we are and you're stuck with whatever air quality you have. You might be thinking to yourself, but isn't air quality in the U.S. getting better? And it is. This plot shows from the um, U.S. EPA the national trends um, since 1990 to about 2020 on there for the criteria air pollutants. All is relative to the um, most recent national standard as of 2020. You may have all heard the PM 2.5 annual standard just got revised down, so this doesn't include that yet. Um, you can see that for most pollutants, we're doing uh, much better. The light green one um, is ozone, where we're still hovering barely <laughs> below the line. Um, but despite this, um, the most recent estimates from 2022 indicate that about 85 million people uh, live in counties with poor air quality. Um, those for one or more NACs, most of those coming from um, exceedances to the ozone standard, but still about 20 million people with exceedances to PM 2.5 and PM 10 standards. And this estimate, uh, I don't, it did not include the new PM 2.5 level, so I imagine that next year this number will go up. On top of that, um, the American Lung Association had done some more kind of digging into wh where people live and the air quality in their neighborhoods and found that not only do four in 10 Americans live in places with unhealthy levels of air pollution, but that people of color are 3.6 times more likely than white people to live in a county with at least three failing air quality grades, according to their rating system. So we're interested in using low cost sensors to try to help us be able to understand potential environmental justice concerns as well. And I want to put this in the context of what um, the EPA calls the environmental health paradigm. So on the red boxes here, we have starting at the top, uh, the contaminant formation and release from a source. Many of you in this room, of course, spending a lot of time thinking about this, transport and transformation in the ambient environment. 
and then kind of hand off to me. And I think a lot about the exposure in the um, ambient environment piece. So individual community population level exposures, that exposure and some proportion of it, depending on what type of pollutant it is, ends up in the body, leading to potentially altered structure or function and resulting in an adverse health outcome. So the, for the purposes today, I'm gonna to take that and kind of condense it down into the pieces that I try to think at least some about, um, emission and transformation, exposure, intake, deposition, and dose, particularly for thinking about particles, and then ultimately health effects. So emission transformation, um, regularly, you know, the US, of course, um, regulates emissions for some industries and sources. And many of the low cost sensors that we're using for this project were actually designed for occupational settings to be able to, say, identify accidental leaks and um, emissions from different types of industries. Um, but many factors can, of course, uh, impact the relationship between emissions and ambient concentrations, even very close to the sources. And many of you are you know, spending a lot more time thinking about this than me. Um, but we are starting to think about you know, some of these big changes. What happened during COVID? What happens when a bridge collapses in Baltimore and the ports get shut down? Um, so and can uh, sensors help us to answer some of these questions? And I'm going to jump in and spend the most of my, majority of my time talking about exposure, because that's what I spend most of my time thinking about. So what do we mean by exposure? People can use this word as kind of a catch-all to mean a lot of different things, actually, even within the field of public health. So often we're thinking about ecologic estimates. So this means exposure assessment for groups of people based on common location, activity, or sources. And so this is what the EPA is doing, right? We set up PM 2.5 monitors all over the country, and we say this monitor that's maybe kind of close to your house represents your exposure. How well that does maybe depends on the pollutant, depends on where you are. So this is really thinking about the ambient exposures, which may or may not be capturing the you know, small scale variability that we hope to be able to pick up with some sensors. And this can really depend on the density of the monitoring network. So Philadelphia and Atlanta are two cities with about 6 million people in their metropolitan areas. And you can see for Philadelphia and Atlanta, the number of regulatory monitors are quite different. Um, and so this really maybe kind of points to an area where low cost sensors could help us. They could also help us understand large gradients around major concentration sources. This is from an old paper, it's over 20 years old, but showing that what we still know to be true is that if you look at things like particle number, black carbon, carbon monoxide, there are these huge enhancements right around roadways that really degrade back to the kind of the um, larger scale conditions within say three to 500 meters. So all of these um, kind of point to opportunities for low cost sensors to be able to understand some of this um, variability if we can calibrate them well enough. So we're doing this with a variety of different types of sensors. The gas sensors, I think, are some of the more challenging ones to use. There are several companies that have, sell, that have developed these um, using um, a couple different types of um, uh, principles of operation. They generally cost 10 to $100. This is just for the sensor itself. This is just for a sensor with leads off of it and no way to actually get any data. So then you need to connect it to a board, collect some data, connect it to a power source, all of these different things. Um, many of these can show a linear response compared to reference instruments. This is data um, from our paper showing a uh, relationship between uh, reference data in black and our monitor for carbon monoxide concentrations in red. You can see we're not doing perfectly, but we're picking up the big trends and not even doing too bad on the peaks. Um, and so if we look at uh, you know, the one-to-one -one plot or the ratio, the probability density of the ratio of our measured carbon monoxide to the reference, you know, it's centered around one, pretty good, not a huge amount of bias, but certainly um, some places where there's, you know, up to maybe 40% um, errors. And those are because many of these sensors can be subject to uh, temperature, relative humidity, and pressure biases, as well as interferences from trace gases. And those are the pieces that can be really kind of hard to account for in the lab. We spent a lot of our time today thinking about the uh, particulate matter low cost sensors. So this is from some um, field work and some laboratory work we did looking at the plant tower sensor. This is the sensor that's in our boxes. It's also what's in the purple air. It's also what's in a whole bunch of other commercially available products. And so our lab-based evaluation, we looked at a bunch of different types of um, particles and shown that 
um, if you compare the kind of gray shading to the black line, we're doing a pretty good job of estimating it after some calibrations. Um, but for the, for the largest particles, if you look at panel D here, I'm not sure if I can use the mouse or not. Whoops, no, I won't use the mouse. Um, in panel D for talc powder, we have this you know, larger size distribution with the tail, probably much larger sizes. You can see we're really not picking up those particles. And we think this is mostly an aspiration problem. Getting those large particles actually into the sensing zone is a challenge and so can lead to these large biases. But for smaller particles, it's doing a pretty good job. Um, if we look at um, our evaluation with the raw data, um, we have uh, a substantial amount of bias. But after correcting for rel mostly relative humidity bias um, and lower plot, you can see we're getting to where we have um, minimal bias over a range of concentrations from, say, 0 to 80 micrograms per cubic meter. Um, and we do better generally with a little bit longer averaging times as well. So after testing a bunch of different types of sensors, we, um, with my collaborators at Yale, um, you can see the publication here that describes the building of this device. Uh, Colby Bueller is a grad student who really kind of spearheaded the building uh, of these uh, with his advisor, Drew Gettner. We built this box. It's about the size of a toaster. It contains sensors for PM with that plant tower sensor that I just showed you, CO, CO2, NO, NO2, methane, ozone, temperature, and humidity. And so we've isolated the gas and particle measurements, um, kind of minimized all the internal volume for fast response. We get data about every six seconds from this device, generally average it up to an hour, but that data is available um, for some people who might be interested in looking at that high level variability. Um, and in some of the sensors we have, or some of the um, boxes, we also had a calibration cylinder um, that contains CO and CO2 so that we could do some onboard calibration measurements as well as zero points for some of the other sensors as well. So then where do we put them? We knew we wanted to apply about 50 of them um, and we wanted to do so in a way that we could characterize the intra-urban air pollution variation. And so we decided to do this using a weighted random sampling approach. So our weights were designed to be based on ambient pollution, which we got from NO2 data from satellites, um, energy production, um, proximity to energy um, generating units, the transportation sector, other large point sources, population density, and then combined all those weights and did a weighted random sampling approach. In this way, we're able to make sure that we're not only capturing the areas that we expect to have the highest concentrations, but also have some variability there. We wanna see, we wanna characterize environmental justice. We also need to know what's going on in the other neighborhoods as well. So we um, picked these sites and then tried to find uh, locations that would actually allow us to come, leave these, plug them in, <laughs> and let us sample for years at a time. Uh, so we um, ended up with a network that actually looks like this today. Um, this is the current network has about 45 sites around Baltimore, kind of mostly within the 695 beltway around the city. Our first monitors were deployed back in October of 2018, but kind of ramped up in more full force in 2019. Um, we have co-locations at four reference sites that we're using to help us um, uh, calibrate this data. Two of them are co-located at the Maryland Department of the Environment sites. So these are, um, you can see there's more of them on this map now. Our MDE site in Baltimore City used to be um, in the downtown area. It has since moved out um, of the city into a park. We also have co-locations at two NIST sites for the greenhouse gases. And so our goal really with this first study that was um, uh, funded by a, the Search Center, which was an EPA funded center, is to really help us get detailed reliability data on these low cost sensor networks. You can also see I've noted here in, in the red, this is from two days ago, um, Google Maps showing that was the bridge that collapsed that I'm sure all of you have heard about on the news. And so we do have um, some monitors that are quite close to that port, to the bridge, as well as to the port infrastructure around the harbor, and are starting to try to think about, you know, what are the impacts on the city from this? Not only the impacts on the harbor itself, but changes to the trucking, changes to the train traffic, where are those trucks gonna go? Um, the bridge has about 30,000 cars per day that goes over it. Um, those will all have to go somewhere else. Trucks that are containing hazardous goods are not allowed to go through the tunnels, which is the way most passenger vehicles kind of go around uh, across 
from um, west to east or east to west across the city. Um, so the question is, are those going to go all the way around the Beltway? Are they going to try to transit the city instead? I think these are questions that everybody's still just starting to think about what the impacts are going to be on Baltimore. We've also been trying to use a lot of different types of calibration approaches to improve our measurements. A lot of this is focused on the PM sensors, as I mentioned. So um, we've used linear calibration approaches and are um, starting to use more and more machine learning approaches. A uh, student in my group that graduated a few years ago had used uh, NG Boost, which is a gradient boosted uh, decision tree uh, to calibrate our raw sensor network without using any of our lab calibration data. And despite um, basically ignoring all the lab calibration that we'd used in our previous uh, assessments, we were able to actually um, somewhat improve our root mean squared errors from about three to a little under two. Um, and that gets a little bit better if you go down to um, 24 hour averages versus uh, one hour measurements. The other kind of interesting thing about using this approach is that instead of only providing a point estimate, the NG boost gives a probability distribution around each measurement. And so we can use this to produce maps like this one. They give us the probability, for example, of PM 2.5 exceeding the annual standard 12 micrograms per cubic meter on some day or over the course of a season or something. So you can kind of play you know, some games with the statistical data to be able to give information um, beyond just simple point estimates. We find that the CO sensors perform pretty well. This is some of our preliminary data showing um, that there is a um, initially a pretty strong temperature dependence. Um, but once we, even just using linear uh, regressions to um, calibrate for um, that, we can get pretty good agreement, even picking up the, the peak concentrations pretty well. Um, and the black, you can see um, the blue line of the sensor tends to be a little bit below. Um, but you know, we're not doing too bad on those. Methane sensor is a particularly challenging one that uh, a current student is trying to, to dig more into now. We have one paper on this. Um, the black line is showing the reference data from NIST. The pink and the green are just showing the different periods, but this is the raw data. And you would look at that and say, there is no way that that is measuring the black line, right? And it's in part because the, this is the only sensor that measures in resistance instead of in voltage, and it is anti-correlated with the actual concentration. It's also very strongly affected by uh, humidity, temperature, and carbon monoxide concentrations. So um, after calibrating the methane sensor, we're doing better. <laughs> um, even in the um, in the validation data set in blue, or in the, the validation data set in blue and the, um, the training data set in red, you know, we're pretty close to the one-to-one -one line, but clearly missing some of those peaks. Um, and with an R-squared just using linear regression of about 5.55. So um, still some areas that we could improve, but you can see we're, we're picking up the general trends although we seem to be um, pretty substantially underestimating the peak uh, methane concentrations on an hourly basis. Um, we also use this to look at the diurnal variation. Um, you can see that in general in the red, um, compared to the NIST measurements, we're kind of underestimating the true variability. We're missing some of those peaks. We're also um, you know, generally capturing the diurnal profile pretty well, except underestimating pretty noticeably um, in the early morning hours. Um, so uh, we're not totally sure why that is. We're starting to dig in with some machine learning. Um, for those, we can get, you know, using our testing data set, really high R squares that don't then work in the testing in the holdout data set. Um, so the machine learning seems to be overfitting some of the, the um, calibration data. So we're still working on that to try to see how we can do a little bit better of picking up those concentrations, particularly those peaks that I think we're really interested in trying to see. As I mentioned, we um, did a whole bunch of lab calibrations and then decided none of those worked in the field. So we're trying to develop also new field calibration approaches. Um, to do so, you know, one approach could be take all of your monitors, gather them up and take them over to the reference site. That would be a lot of work, a lot of time. And ultimately our goal is to be able to see how these sensors work when they're not at the reference site because the reference site is already measuring there, right? So. 
Our goal has been to develop a calibration approach in which we can use well-mixed periods over the city to be able to comprise a testing data set or a training data set and then be able to apply that calibration out to all the other non-well-mixed times. So we started testing this out with a student from um, Yiting Lin, who's a master's student in the biostatistics department, um, looking at the two, um, uh, two boxes that were co-located with the Maryland Department of the Environment site. So these are um, where the state is collecting regulatory air quality data to report to the EPA. So um, to do this, basically we've looked at both linear approaches and random forest models. Um, you can see, particularly for the, the peak concentrations, um, that the random forest, really both the highs and the lows, the random, for, uh, the random forest is doing better in the pink than the linear model in the green compared to the MDE station at the background. But then our goal is like, okay, we can calibrate at these two sites. What about the rest of them? For the PM, it's relatively straightforward. The calibration that you uh, get at the those two sites, you can just ca you apply to all the other sensors. But for the gas sensors, you can't. They all have different baselines. They have different slopes. And so what you need to do is come up with kind of a functional form and then find unit-specific uh, coefficients for each of those. To do so, what we're trying to do is um, be able to identify these kind of well-mixed periods in the city and then test out that how that works. So the way we did this first is what we called um, the um, Oracle model, which is basically I take the co-located data and I train it there and I see what my R squared is. Then um, the proxy model is saying, what if instead of using the co-located data, I trained it using the data at the other site and then tested it against the data that's actually co-located against? Then I can identify, are these well-mixed periods actually doing a good job? And so we tried different definitions of what constitutes a well-mixed period. You could say either when there's low variability in PM, there's low variability in NO2, or maybe there's low variability in both and have a smaller training data set. When we did that, we found that the best approach was to use when the um, PM or the NO2 concentrations were very similar between the two MDE sites in terms of a percent difference. Of course, we want to be able to still capture those peaks. So if you just use the absolute difference, you would only really have a training data set that had low concentrations and that would not be useful. So as a percent difference, we did this and you can see that the out of sample R squared from training a model with its actual co-located data to training a model with the data that's actually halfway across the city, we only went from an R squared of 0.63 to 0.62. So pretty minimal information loss by using this approach. So this is kind of while we're trying to move forward with applying, um, calibrating the rest of these sensors. We also tried this with CO2. Um, we find that we're still underestimating the highest concentrations of CO2 as well. Um, and for um, both CO2 and methane, we have additional challenges in that, um, you know, for MDE, they're measuring outdoor concentrations at the ground. And we're measuring outdoor concentrations at the ground. Uh, but for the NIST site, they're measuring off of an inlet that's um, at elevation. And we also, to be able to sample off of that, needed to put our box actually inside their measurement system. So they're running inside in their lab. Um, so this means that these boxes are never being exposed to really higher cold temperatures, you know, less variability in relative humidity, and not seeing ground level concentrations. So, you know, we're still assessing whether this approach that we saw work pretty well for NO2 um, will work as well at the ground level. Um, but uh, you can see that even if we still looking at the ratio of our sensor to reference CO2 concentration, you know, there's not a huge bias. We are under missing um, some of the highest concentrations though. If we use this approach and apply it, then we can create some maps of exposures. This is the mean CO2 concentration in April 2020. You can see that the scale there is not very big. <laughs> it's going from 426.8 to 428. So really kind of trying to force you to see some variability there. Um, but if you look at the 95th percentile, we can start seeing a bit more um, heterogeneity in that sample. So starting to pick up, um, sorry backwards. <laughs> Some of these higher concentrations in areas where we um, know there's you know, the incinerator, the I-95 tunnel, the port activities are all happening down here. Um, we expect all those to be producing um, higher CO2 emissions than much of the rest of the city. So somewhat promising, still 
um, some work to go that was based on model R squared of 0.55. So still some area to go. So that's what we're doing in the ambient network. But by exposure, we might still mean other things as well. So we might be thinking also about indoor exposures. And I work with a group of uh, medical doctors um, in the hospital and the School of Medicine, trying to think about how indoor air quality um, impacts particularly susceptible populations too. And in doing so, uh, we have found that indoor concentrations can often greatly exceed outdoor concentrations for PM in particular. And that's because people are cooking, they might be smoking, they might be using candles or running vacuum cleaners. They're doing all of these things inside their homes um, as these very uh, strong sources, as well as getting contributions from the outdoor air. So we actually run a lot of studies. We're going into people's homes, setting up air quality measurement systems, for 20 years, we've been doing this with kind of filter-based approaches, standard gravimetric approaches um, for PM, as well as passive badges for NO2 and airborne nicotine to look at smoking. Um, we collect allergen with settled dust samples, as well as doing surface dust sampling. And um, more recently, particularly during the COVID pandemic, we started deploying sensors. This is because we weren't allowed to go into people's homes and set up all of this equipment inside their homes and there were these, you know, distance restrictions, right? And so instead, we just went to people's homes, we dropped off a of purple air on their, their front doorstep and said, please take this inside and plug it in. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. <laughs> um, and so uh, we're now continuing to do both approaches, and I'll show you some, some comparisons in a minute. Uh, I'm part of um, what we call the Breathe Center. Um, that's been doing these measurements for over 20 years in Baltimore City, showing that particularly the study is going back in time. This is for data collected between 2001 and 2003. Um, the 25th percentile of weekly average PM 2.5 exposures was above the 75th percentile at the outdoor concentrations, comparing the exact same week. <laughs> so, um, and also that 75% of the measurements were above the than EPA annual limit, which is now much lower than where it is on that plot. We've also used this data to look at common household activities and see how they correlate with PM 2.5 concentrations, even as a weekly average. So you can see clear associations with smoking, sweeping, stove use, and stove use even more so uh, with NO2 concentrations in particular, as mo um, say about 60% of people in Baltimore have a gas stove. So we see these high concentrations and we've been able to show, and my colleagues in particular were able to show these um, relationships of indoor PM concentrations or indoor NO2 concentrations with um, you know, adverse outcomes among say adults with COPD and children who have asthma. Um, and so what can we do about that? So our more recent studies have been trying to um, design interventions to be able to improve air quality and hopefully be able to improve um, you know, different types of health outcomes for these potentially susceptible populations. So one of the things we've been looking at the most is using air purifiers to reduce particulate matter concentrations. This was in a study among children with asthma between the ages of 8 and 18. Um, each family was provided with air cleaners. And so if you look at concentrations um, at baseline, uh, between the active group and the placebo group. The placebo group gets an air purifier. It has no filters in it, so it's just pumping air through it. Um, we see that after, um, you know, baseline before they before either group receives any air purifiers, you know, there's a lot of variability between homes, but no real differences between the groups. After um, receiving the air purifier after three months, you can see no real improvements or <laughs> change at all in the group with the placebo filter, but a pretty substantial, about 62% reduction in PM 2.5 concentrations compared to only a 12% reduction for those in the placebo group. We've also done this in uh, the Clean Air Study, which is a paper I shared with you all, um, in which not only did it have a particulate filter, but also a carbon filter, which will remove some of the glasses. We saw in this study of adults with COPD, pretty similar reduction in PM 2.5, 54% compared to 62%. So 50 or 60% reduction in PM um, from using an air purifier, but also found a 28% reduction in NO2. So the way you can read this plot is, this is compared to everybody's baseline concentration. And so um, the uh, lines that I've made thicker here are showing for the, um, the placebo group, 
um, that didn't have an active carbon filter in it. You know, no real change, kind of bouncing up and down around that 0%. But within one week after the baseline measurement, you can see about a 30% reduction for people in NO2 concentrations that persists out to six months at least. The other symbols here are for PM, so you can see even you know, 50-60% reductions in PM 2.5 and PM 10. So what does this mean for people? Um, we use a bunch of different outcomes, but one of the common ones um, that people who are interested in COPD measure is what's called the St. George's Respiratory Questionnaire. It asks people a bunch of questions about symptoms as well as other aspects of their function. And so I'm just sharing a couple of these with you. The SGRQ total, you can see in the first group of bars, a not statistically significant improvement in their SGRQ score. But then if we focused in in the second set of bars, um, um, just those participants who use their air cleaner at least 80% of the time, then we see a statistically significant improvement. And if we further restrict to only people who use their air cleaner 100% of the time, an even stronger impact. If we focus in on the portion of the questionnaire that's really um, related to the symptoms, the effect becomes even more um, strong. So this also kind of shows a dose response, which we would expect to see of having an air purifier in your house that you never bothered to turn on probably doesn't do anything. <laughs> if you actually use it, you can improve your air quality. And um, we showed not only did those who have active filter have fewer symptoms, but also less need for rescue medication use. Um, and that this was effect was stronger. People use their air purifier at least 80% of the time. So Back to sensors, um, we wanted to be able to um, see, can we deploy these kinds of sensors for doing longer term assessments of air quality? And those estimate, those different um, outcomes before, we're setting up filters, we're setting up passive samples. You can only really leave those out for say a week. The pumps you know, need to be calibrated. It's a lot of work to kind of set those up. The low cost sensors, you could even mail them to people, right? And just ask them to plug them in and see how they do. But do we trust the data? So after COVID, we were able to go back into the homes. We kept putting out the purple airs, but went back to our filter-based measurements as well. And so we used a couple different calibration approaches to see how well we could do with this. So the green points here are just the raw data. Take the purple air exactly as it is. And you can see it overestimates the concentrations compared to that gravimetric weekly average concentration, but highly correlated. If we applied... Um, two different types of calibration approaches. One, using the exact same calibration that I showed you from before for our ambient sensors that we have because we're using the same internal sensor. Or the EPA has also developed a US-wide calibration. Easy to use. Everybody can use it, right? <laughs> How do you compare? And we see, you know, compared to the one-to-one -one line, the US calibration maybe overestimates a little bit. We maybe underestimate a little bit, but both very highly correlated. So, and also, if you're interested for health studies, it may be enough to be able to just break people into groups. Who are the highly exposed people? Who are the more you know, lowly exposed people? And be able to compare this. And clearly, given these high correlations, we'd be able to do that quite well. We haven't evaluated the higher temporal resolution measurements within the indoor environment. Um, but I think um, future work, we'd like to be able to, to look at that more and be able to see how does your air quality today or yesterday impact your symptoms or your lung function um, on any given day, or the likelihood that you had to go to an ER. And so this really kind of speaks to a lot of, um, you know, this time scale of exposure assessment. You know, the regulations are on different time scales. But really, when people say, well, what should we measure for a health effect? You know, the correct answer is, what health effect? <laughs> right? Are you thinking about um, lung cancer? Then why need to measure for 20 years? If you're thinking about an asthma exacerbation, then you know, maybe the last couple hours is most important. Um, we need to be thinking more about what are the individual sources, can an ecological approach work or not? Um, and sensors really kind of give us the opportunity to start thinking about characterizing these longer duration exposures. Is that week really representative of your typical exposure like we've been kind of assuming for the last 20 years? Where are we on time? Um, one of the last things I wanted to talk about um, within the exposure realm is doing personal exposure assessment. This is often considered the gold standard. We're going to give people sensors, have them carry them around in a backpack, and go about their daily life. 
in their daily life. They're driving in cars, they're eating in restaurants, they're going to work, they're doing all of these things that we can't capture by just sticking a monitor in their living room. We can also pair these uh, air quality measurements with the GPS to know when and where people are being exposed to different types of pollutants. The first uh, study I want to show is we were trying to do this in occupational settings. This was a nice place to try to deploy a low cost sensors as a first step for a couple reasons. One, you know, the, in the occupational environment we were interested in was a large manufacturing uh, facility. This is inside temperatures much more controlled than outside. Relative humidity is much more controlled than outside, as well as much higher concentrations of PM than you would observe in the ambient setting. As I mentioned, much of these, many of these sensors were designed to be used in these situations, not being tested to the very low concentrations we have outdoors. So our goal here was to be able to create what we're calling hazard maps. Um, concentrations of, uh, this, for example, is particulate matter over um, a, the geographical space of a facility. Um, this is useful for uh, the company. We can visually communicate risk, ID hazard sources, and characterize spatial variability. But, you know, if you have to use an instrument that costs $5,000 each, we can only have so many of these. So can low-cost sensors help us kind of uh, do this? The second piece that we wanted to add on to this is what if instead of just creating a map, we could estimate personal exposures? This is one of the big differences between occupational exposure assessment and ambient or environmental exposure assessment. Remember we said the EPA says, I'm gonna stick a monitor kind of close to your house and say that's your exposure. In the occupational setting that is not done, people carry devices with them and measure personal samples and those are compared to a personal exposure assessment limit. That's what the, the like OSHA would do to, to assess exposures. So we need to really know what's happening to workers on an individual basis. This is also because if you're a worker and you're welding, obviously the concentration that you're experiencing is not the same thing that's happening in that table across the room where it was convenient to stick a sensor. So by having lots of low cost sensors, we want to be able to get this high resolution information over this facility and then be able to track people's movements so they don't have to actually carry equipment with them every day, but we could start to build up um, measurements for each of those individuals. So you can imagine at time one, this person was at one location, at some time later, they might be doing some other process and so on. And we can integrate these time resolved maps with their personal location data to be able to estimate their true exposures. So here's an example of uh, PM2, PM data um, from this low cost sensor. These are different facilities. And the gray is showing an actual enclosed office. The rest of these are showing the types of processes that were happening, but this is actually just an open facility. So you can kind of see as different processes are turning off related to cutting, welding, blasting, different types of um, welding that are happening. Um, you can see the concentrations just within one day even um, dramatically vary over the course of um, the day. So what we did is we had our, our study staff, this is Larissa, uh, completely loaded down with all of the instruments that we would want to measure. Of course, it would be completely unrealistic to ask a worker to do this and say, now go do your really complicated, dangerous job. <laughs> so, um, so we did this instead. And we had her um, carrying sensors for PM, CO, ozone, and noise and then compared that data to what we got from the sensor drip. And then she took a log of where she was at different locations. This could be done automated um, with different types of technologies now. GPS doesn't work well indoors, but there are all sorts of other types of approaches that could be used. So when we do this, you see that for um, PM, we do a pretty good job picking up the peaks and the kind of troughs and the um, different exposure assessment. For CO, we do a pretty good job of picking up the time series, but it turned out our, our sensor was really missing those peak concentrations. This is a recurring theme, right? missing the peak concentrations. And for noise, it's pretty loud in there pretty much everywhere, pretty much all the time. So it looks like we're doing a good job, but really it's just that it's loud everywhere pretty consistently. Um, but we thought this was encouraging. Um, Using not low cost sensors, we also, when I was, this is a project that I started when I was a postdoc, it's kind of my introduction to doing human subjects research. Um, this is, I think, the other paper that I shared with you guys, comparing how can people maybe change their exposures by altering their commute pattern. So instead of using low cost sensors, we use these kind of medium cost sensors that we trusted a little more, put them all in a backpack, basically loaded down like Larissa was, and then asked people to commute on um, different days either bicycling on a high traffic route, 
bicycling on a low traffic route, driving on a high traffic route, or driving on a low traffic route. So a high traffic route could be like driving down Main Street versus a low traffic route, driving a couple blocks off, or taking a bike path versus driving on a on a city or riding your bike on a city street in a, in a bike lane. In total, we have 44 participants with eight commute days um, carrying all these different sensors. So GPS, um, a heart rate monitor, an accelerometer that also measured temperature, humidity, and light, but kind of tells us whether people are carrying the backpack as well. And then measurements for PM, CO, PM 2.5, and no, noise are what I'm gonna kind of focus on in the next measurements, but we also had ultrafines, VOCs, and NO2 for a subset of participants. Put all this in a backpack and ask people to carry it with, um, while they commute. So all of these sensors were running at 10 second resolution. We wanted to be able to capture what's happening as people pass through intersections, for example. So in the end, with all of the 10 sensors at 10 second resolution, 86,000 data points per 24 hour sample times 44 people times eight. Yeah. It ends up being a ton of data um, that we were able to look at. So if we look at this, we can break down all this high temporal resolution data and be able to pair it with where we know people are going, they're home early in the morning, wake up, start cooking breakfast or whatever, and their exposures go up, and then they commute to work. At work, um, for most people, exposures were quite low. A lot of these people had kind of office jobs. This person uh, drove to an eatery around lunchtime, drove back to work, and then in the afternoon after work, um, drove to a park and be um, kind of southeast portion of the map there and took a walk on an unpaved path. But what we can see is that if we compare the black carbon to the PM 2.5, you pick up different features. So for example, at big intersections, you can see, sorry, I really wish I could, oh, I can't point. Can you see my arrow? This big intersection here, you can see these huge spikes in black carbon to the cars when there really is no increase in PM 2.5. Whereas at home, you can see people doing different activities that produce PM 2.5, as well as walking in this unpaved area, people are kicking up um, PM 2.5, riding bikes and things like that, but there's no cars allowed. And so black carbon concentrations were really low. And it turns out we see a huge amount of variability. So these are all 44 participants um, looking at their cumulative PM 2.5 um, exposure averaged across their eight um, measurement days. And I bet if you asked most of those people, they would say, I probably do about the same thing every day, but really there's a huge amount of day-to-day -day variability. This is just showing for one participant, um, their exposure to um, PM 2.5 broken down by their different microenvironments, home, work, transit, eatery, and other. Um, and it's not just the this one person. In the plot on the right, you can see the different days of measurements um, on a log scale. <laughs> so showing, you know, at least one, often two orders of magnitude difference between their lowest and their highest exposure, even just on eight days. So what did this mean for their compute? In each of these plots, I'm showing a comparison to car on the most direct route as kind of being the baseline case for an American, right? And then in these different shaded panels, showing taking a car on a less traffic route, cycling on a direct route, or cycling on an alternate route like a bike path. The different colored symbols are showing PM uh, black carbon and black PM 2.5 and uh, the darker blue particle number concentration, which is proportional to ultrafines in the lighter blue, um, and then the carbon monoxide in the kind of greenish color. The zero with the dashed line would be no change, no improvement. What we see is that um, for most of the um, car alternate routes, we see improvements in concentration um, for uh, black carbon, for uh, particle number concentration, and for carbon monoxide um, compared to uh, the driving on the primary route. The filled symbols are showing just the mean, just the average concentration during that commute event. The cumulative instead is actually accounting for the amount of time it takes to get there. So as we get to the bicycling routes, you can see that even though there wasn't as much of an improvement, if you consider that it also takes longer to cycle to get there, then you can see you get to where there's pretty large increases in exposures for cyclists, um, uh, particularly for uh, black carbon, um, and uh, for particle number concentration. But if you could send people on an alternate route, get them off the roads, get them away from the cars a little bit, we can have some improvements, particularly for um, carbon monoxide exposures.
We also did a similar thing in Baltimore, looking at uh, personal exposure uh, for children with asthma. We put a similar um, types of devices into this backpack and asked them to carry it as they went to school and their other activities. And again, we see a huge amount of variability. Um, in this study, we recruited kids who were already part of a larger study. We were doing those home monitors, putting that you know, little basket full of all of our equipment inside people's homes. We also collected data from the MDE um, showing the ambient air quality during that same one week period. And their personal exposure uh, points are shown in the circles. So you can see that uh, for some children, um, we did this for 50 different kids over uh, four consecutive days. So kind of a week um, period, dropping equipment off on a Monday and picking it up on a Friday. So for some kids, uh, the difference between their ambient and their home not super different. Their home was pretty close to their personal. Um, we probably didn't gain a lot of information. But for other kids, their home exposure is just completely, <laughs> um, you know, so much higher than the ambient exposures at the same time, and that their personal exposure could be even higher than that on some days. So um, we're still moving on that. So where are we on time? Probably run through this really quickly. The last things I've been kind of thinking about is for particles, you have a situation where you inhale particles. Some of those particles you actually exhale. Thank goodness, right? <laughs> so can we do a better job of an exposure assessment by thinking about what are the fraction of particles that actually end up in your body and not just PM 2.5, um, like this purple line. So all if you had a typical size distribution, all of those ones shaded green, you would actually exhale, but they'd be fully captured by a PM 2.5 sample. So we developed this lung deposition sampler. It's not really a sensor. It's actually a piece of foam that's been engineered in such a way that it matches this um, relationship that we see between um, the total de deposition. So as a function of particle diameter, really small particles deposit with about 100%. Um, particles larger than a bite of micron deposit at 100%, but there's a minima at about 0.3 microns. So we um, use polyurethane foam because it has a kind of a similar structure to what you see uh, for um, the deep lung, the way the alveoli work. So we did this also in an occupational study where I asked people to carry a traditional IOM sample, that's what would be common in occupational exposure assessment, and then also our new lung deposition sampler. And these were uh, workers who did stainless steel welding, and then also collected urinary samples pre and post shift. And what we found was that if we looked at chromium and nickel, two metals that are common in stainless steel welding and have a short half-life, kind of come out in the urine relatively quickly, that um, while well, we saw a statistically significant association between our lung deposited measurement and um, their urinary measurements, there was no correlation at all between the kind of traditional measurement method. So we think that this can help us kind of get a better assessment of what people are being actually exposed to. So wrapping up, we think, I think, you know, sensors can help us with a lot of different things for public health. We're combining different types of air quality sensors and GPS sensors to think about different microenvironments, a broad suite of types of pollutants that we could be exposed to, as well as the starting to think about being able to use sensors for health measurements. We're starting to deploy um, handheld spirometers that people can have at home with them and take measurements every morning and every evening. There's at-home sleep studies that can be done. We're starting to deploy those in um, some studies as well. And then we can pair all of this high, resolu high temporal resolution information to say, what's happening when I'm commuting? What's happening when I'm at work or school or at home? And then also start to think about what's the appropriate time lag if I'm exposed to something right now, when can I expect a health outcome? When should I, how should studies be designed to be able to best estimate that? And then of course, can we do, do I use this data to identify interventions to help improve public health? So a lot of people to thank across the Breathe and Search Centers as well as our funding um, from NIHS, NI, and HD, and the EPA, um, as well as NIOSH for the occupational work that you saw. And thanks to BSEC for having me here today. Thanks to all of you. Thank you very much. And as usual, let's open this up for questions. If it's okay, I'm going to pop yeah. the Zoom window so we can see if people chat things in. Nothing in there yet. Any questions in the room? Yes. I see two already. So for the part where you explained um, the locations where the sensors are located. Mm -hmm. Could you further explain how each element is weighted? Yeah, so we 
um, going to take forever basically kind of came up with weights between zero and one kind of um, the relative magnitude of each kind of thing and then just added them up so basically each of those the air quality the population density proximity to different types of things were all weighted equally to each other because we didn't have any reason <laughs> to particularly do one higher than the other and so the combined weights is what you see in the bigger map and then we um, used a weighted random sampling approach to identify all the locations of those triangles and then try to put our sensors near those triangles. I had a question on the deposition sensor for the lungs. Yeah. Where did you guys get that idea from? Is that just like you said polyurethane? Yeah. So it's polyurethane foam. And it kind of, this was also work that started when I was a, a postdoc. I was, um, we were interested in this because polyurethane has that, you know, if you've ever opened up a seat, you can see it has that kind of open cell pore structure. And so as particles have to make the twist and turns through that foam or the twist and turns through your <laughs> deposition tract, they're kind of subject to the same processes, right? There's impaction happening, diffusion happening, gravitational settling happening. All of those different processes are similar. So we thought, can we design a foam that has a similar properties? And so basically what we end up with is it's a plug of foam. It's about four centimeters long and 0.8 centimeters in diameter. It can be um, housed in a in a tube, and then you pull the air through it, and it basically only captures the fraction of particles that would deposit in your respiratory tract instead of a filter that would capture 100% of the particles. So the challenge we have with it still is um, a lot of exposure assessment. We use gravimetric approaches, so just wave that piece of of foam before and after. Polyurethane is hygroscopic and staticky and everything that makes it hard to weigh. <laughs> so um, that was a reason for, you know, I first started at Hopkins, we did the occupational health study um, and we wanted to focus on metals because we actually measured those with ICPMS. So um, for now, we kind of need to measure an actual chemical, um, but maybe in the future we can find a better material to make foam out of. So if anyone's a material scientist, let me know. <laughs> There is a very large program in that here. Yeah. Um, I don't think we have much of that in the room at the moment, but maybe we should connect you to those folks later. One? Cool. Yeah, right. Material scientist. Great. Other questions? Hi. Uh, thank you for the great talk. I was really interested in the part where you were measuring concentrations um, within that workspace. I mm -hmm. believe it was the engine manufacturing company. Yeah. Um, so I guess my question is, um, and using the sensors, I guess, um, pre and post calibration, did you find there to be any difference in between like reading staying within permissible exposure limits or um, varying outside? And if so, did companies sort of take that into account and try yeah. to adjust their practices? I'm impressed you know the phrase of permissible exposure limit. Good job. <laughs> but as you probably know, permissible exposure limits are quite high. And so they're generally not exceeded. Um, and so we didn't have exceedances, but there was a huge amount of variability between locations and within a day and between days. Um, some of that also kind of based on what's happening with the ventilation system, how warm is it outside, how often are they bringing fresh air into the facility. So we had this um, large you know, variability that we were trying to capture. Um, so I guess two things, I think, you know, this was a company that my collaborator, Tom Peters at the University of Iowa had been working with for a long time. So their industrial hygienists were really interested in this project and kind of learning like um, what facility, which, which specific tasks are leading to the highest concentrations in the facility and then being able to think about what are the engineering controls we could, could apply to reduce those concentrations. So they were good in that regard. In terms of also the pre and post, you know, what we did see in, the, in this facility in particular is because the concentrations are, you know, still within the permissible exposure limits for an occupational setting, much, 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 much higher than you would see in ambient air, right? Like in ambient air, we measure things in micrograms per cubic meter. In occupational settings, we measure things in milligrams per cubic meter, right? So order, you know, three orders of magnitude difference there that we're kind of like thinking about. Um, as we started looking at our PM sensors in particular, like actually over the course of a year, like very visible gunk in the sensors that we really don't see in the ambient environment. So those did impact our ability to measure PM over the long course, because you know, these particles are getting on the sensor, they're getting on the detector, they're impacting the measurement. So um, I think part of what we'd like to think about for future work is, you know, what are the maintenance requirements for that kind of a sensor? And, um, you know, 
I, I think both studies are kind of extreme in the ambient network. You have temperature extremes and different things. And in this, you have kind of more concentration extremes. And I think in both settings, trying to think about what are the requirements for maintaining those sensors networks long term. Thanks. Um, this is kind of a, I don't know, big picture, a long term question. I think this is really important what you're doing. And I understand you know, how hard it is and the implications and that sort of thing. But it also gives me pause if somebody walked out of here and thought, oh, I should take my car and not take my bicycle because I'm getting yeah. more part particulate matter that's less than 2.5 micron or whatever it is. Um, so do you have, is part of your team thinking about how to message this or just the implications of it? Because yeah. it's, every choice we make is cost benefit analysis. So right. How can you help people in the room even think about this? Yeah, and so so that was work that was started when I was a postdoc, and that team has continued to kind of do that of, yes, you probably get a little bit more PM exposure, but you're also getting exercise. <laughs> exercise is really good for you, right? And the benefit is still probably better. So when we communicate this with the public, that is the take-home message that exercising is still better. But if you can, take a bike path. Try to be away from the cars, which is easier to do than in Fort Collins than all cities. So Baltimore, I would say it's still a challenge. Thank you for yeah. the talk. So continuing on the same bike topic, mm -hmm. um, as you said, the bikers have, or cyclists have like higher exposure um, and there's alternative routes that they can take. Is that happening only in Baltimore or like throughout the US? So that study actually took place in Fort Collins, Colorado, where Colorado State is and Fort Collins has about the best bike infrastructure, I think, of at least top three in the country. Um, so we would say in all cities, it's not as easy to say that. But I think our kind of goal with this study is also to help promote for cities. These are the benefits that you could expect to see if you invest in this kind of infrastructure, like trying to get cars um, away from cities or cars away from the bicyclists and um some cities around the country, like Barcelona, is really ahead on this kind of stuff. They've actually shut down whole lanes and they'll have traffic and then big kind of plant barriers and then the bikes off to the side to help kind of separate um, those two groups, both from the safety perspective as well as an air pollution perspective. Yeah. Yeah, great talk. Uh, just a question, maybe not related to the talk, but I just wonder because you just now you mentioned like something like overfitting for the data. I wonder, do you see any opportunity like uh, using the latest AI model to address that? Um, is there any other direction that can use AI for for any type of future research for your direction or things like that? Uh, I just wonder about uh, can AI be in uh, be an important role for addressing some of the previous method or new direction or things like that? So I will say I am definitely not the AI expert, but I welcome students to come talk to me about their ideas about how we should be using AI more effectively. Um, you know, we're using these machine learning approaches to try to get away from enforcing, you know, imposing a linear structure on these calibration approaches. Those are showing improvements, but certainly I think, yeah, there's probably more that we could be doing and yeah, happy to talk. One more, then we can. Thank you. I think I saw on one of your um, one of your plots that for uh, I can't remember if this was from Fort Collins or from Baltimore, but in large part, people most of people's exposure from those personal samplings was from their house, mm -hmm. from their home. Yeah, probably because that's where they spend most of their time. Yeah, I'm wondering if there's any kind of analysis you've done. You know, I'm thinking about Baltimore where we're, we're we were looking at a lot of like heat stress and things like that. Is there any kind of interaction that you're able to see? Between particles and heat? Yeah, heat or just like, you know, basically what I'm seeing from what you're saying is the more time people are spending inside, the more their exposures level are. So if the weather is such that yeah. you're going to spend more time inside, hot or cold, hmm. is there an interaction that you're, you're able to see? Or, or is, I don't know, you even looked in that direction yet. But. Um, I mean, I think that's true. We see this. There's been studies that have looked at it and the majority of Americans of American adults spend 90 plus percent of their time indoors <laughs> at home or at work. Um, and so 
yes that plot i think the one that you're thinking about that has all the bar across that was accumulative so it's basically concentration times time right so your home ends up kind of dominating everything but uh for temperature in baltimore i don't know if darren's presented this work here before they've kind of looked at this of like the high temperatures uh we see in baltimore city row homes can be um you know very high and actually stay high even overnight when it cools down outside um, this can be um, particularly exacerbated in neighborhoods where people maybe don't feel safe opening windows and things and so you can have um, there is literature showing that if people are exposed to very high temperatures for long periods of time and don't kind of have overnight periods to cool down that that ends up being worse in the long run particularly for older people so i think there is um, I don't know if it's interaction or just kind of a, a duration effect of, of those high exposures. So one of the things that I haven't talked about, but we're um, starting a study is looking at cool roofs. Did I mention this to you? <laughs> yeah. So um, looking at another intervention that you, you replace, you know, most roofs in Baltimore, kind of darkly colored asphalt kind of roofs. Um, if we can replace those with white roofs that will reflect a lot of sunlight away, can we get temperatures in these homes a little bit more manageable since a lot of the homes don't have air conditioning or maybe only have window units and maybe you can afford to run them and maybe you can't or maybe they work um, in some rooms better than others. So, yeah. All right, let's thank Kirsten again. Wonderful talk. Thanks for all the questions. See you in two weeks. Two weeks. Eclipse next.